I had told some people throughout this week that if I did not get my visuals done, then I was going to do interpretive dance. And very motivated by that last night, I slapped together a PowerPoint, which is super low tech. I'm not convinced that it's actually going to match what I say today, so you know, you, you may want to ignore it. So welcome to SEAS 2018. I am happy to be with you here today. There was an extended period of time this summer and early fall when it was not clear whether SEAS 2018 would occur as the EC grappled with how to respond to the Missouri Travel Advisory and how to respond in ways that respected and served our members, that allowed us to do our work and fulfill our mission as a disciplinary organization, and that enabled us to be responsible stewards of SEAS and its resources. This is not the first time we have faced difficulty as an organization. As I noted in my position statement on the ballot when I ran for this position, there are serious challenges to the integrity of our profession and the, uh, and the field of composition. But facing challenges is what SEAS does. We are the organization we are today because of the challenges that we have confronted. Our ability to evolve is what sustains us. And this willingness to struggle and strive makes me very optimistic about our organization's future. Moments of crisis, like the one in Kansas City, push us to respond, to reflect, to think creatively, and to work together. They create impetus for change. Ultimately, this particular crisis created a moment of kairos, an opportunity to act uh, on our policies and our values with one another and with the local community. And I'd like to recognize a few of the individuals and groups who were instrumental in turning this problem into possibility. Thanks to then Chair Linda Adler Kasner for her thoughtful and responsive leadership with difficult discussions and decisions. Thanks to Asao Inouye for using this challenge as an opportunity to reconsider what our convention time can look like and do, providing space for us to think, labor, and act together. Thanks to the Social Justice Action Committee and the Local uh, Arrangements Committee, who have worked, I'm sorry, this is really hard to say, who have worked for months on initiatives that promote member safety, access, engagement. One particular event I'll call your attention to is the all attendee event scheduled for the ballroom at 1.45 this afternoon, this ballroom. Once I realized that I was on the hook for presenting this chair's address, I had to figure out something to say. The opening to Andrea Lunsford's 1989 address perhaps best captures my sentiments about preparing this talk. She said, the opportunity to talk openly on a public occasion about what is uppermost in one's mind is a rare occasion. What is on my mind, I idly wondered, and suddenly I was terrified by the kind of eerie silence between my ears. For me, I wondered if asking Siri or Alexa might help. And then I entered a period of intense reflection and cleaning. Apparently, I cannot begin writing until my cupboards and pantries were organized, but mostly intense reflection. I read the past 40 years of chairs' addresses, and I realized that everything I considered talking about had already been pretty well covered. In fact, the collection provides a fascinating glimpse into our, sorry, there's not much light here. <laughs> um, the collection provides a fascinating glimpse into the evolution of our organization and discipline and the history that has shaped it. These addresses reveal the range of scholarship in the discipline, most notably the scholarship of teaching and learning, and address persistent issues, particularly around inclusion and equity within the organization, the discipline, and the profession. These addresses are a powerful narrative of who we are. And I fleetingly thought about patchwork plagiarizing from each of the chairs and then calling it good. I also reviewed C's history. The organization, as most of you know, was born out of a need for space for the National Council of Teachers of English for college level faculty to discuss freshman English. After its inaugural gathering in 1949 to discuss topics such as pedagogy, theory, research, recruitment, retention, and training of writing faculty, NCT's first conference, a college level group dedicated to post-secondary composition and communication was founded. 
According to an early draft of the first C's constitution, the purpose of this new organization was to unite college teachers of composition and communication in an organization which can consider all matters relevant to their teaching, including in general teachers, subject matter, methods, and students. Members of this organization would go on to create the modern discipline of writing studies using first-year writing classrooms as spaces to theorize and research. I turn to my own passions and interests and expertise, to your colleges, teaching assessment, policy and advocacy, and I realized that what connects me, C's, and the discipline together is first-year writing. Since the idea of transforming crisis into chirotic moments is what I'd like to focus on today, I decided to return to our disciplinary and organizational roots from my talk. It is where we as an organization began and is where I found my way into the organization. Although I developed my love of reading and writing apart from my schooling, I had intended to be a, a author and artist when I was young. Uh, in retrospect, I recognize that my first interactions with the discipline occurred when I was in high school. I attended a small, inter, a small rural high school that produced more future farmers than college graduates. We didn't have an AP program, but my college prep English class centered on writing, not literature. Clearly, by the late 1980s, the discipline of writing studies was insinuating itself into the furthest reaches of post of public education for the preparation of college English to be seen as preparation of academic writing. Apparently my high school preparation served me well because I was exempted from first year writing in college, but I insisted on taking it anyway because I loved writing and I was sure that, it, um, you know, why on earth would I want to skip what I imagined would be my favorite class in college? It, it was not, but it was fine. <laughs> My first year writing experience reflected the state of the discipline in the late 1980s. Graduate programs in composition and rhetoric were proliferating, yes, but they hadn't yet reached Washington State University. My first year writing course represented what I imagine was a fairly typical experience of students attending public state universities. So, um, I was taught by a graduate student studying literature, supervised and presumably trained by a writing program administrator, do you recognize this name? The course was computer assisted, which I resisted because it messed up with my writing process that I had become accustomed to. Pre-writing, writing, revising and editing. There was some attention to process and writing to learn. The instructor conferenced with us on some drafts and we kept a journal as part of the class. We primarily researched and wrote about current issues. Fast forward a half dozen or so years, and I reconnected with first year writing again, this time in the role of teacher. As I began my graduate work and a teaching assistantship as part of the second class of Washington State's University fledgling RET comp program. I flourished in this space, where theory and practice, teaching and scholarship were directly and symbiotically connected. I applied what I learned in my teaching writing methodology class taught by my former uh, British Romanticism professor, Rich Haswell, uh, directly to English 101 classes I was teaching. And then I studied and theorized about the results. After graduate school, I returned to teaching high school. But after being introduced to basic writing and the teaching of a non-traditional student in Victor Villanueva's class, my sights were set on the community college. And a few years later, I had a full-time job teaching at Yakima Valley College and reconnected with the organization that formed my professional home ever since, NCTE, SEAS, and TICA. And for nearly two decades, my intellectual and professional work has been inextricably linked to first-year writing, not unlike the work of many of you in this room and the teaching majority which make up this organization and this field. We face serious problems as a field, and I see first-year writing as both the source of many of these problems and the place where we have the opportunity and capacity to create change. I am not suggesting that C's limits his work to first-year writing. Our discipline is more expansive than that, and our organization represents the diversity of our discipline. As Gwen Pugh recognized in her 2011 chair's address, as a field that is interdisciplinary, it's bigger than RET comp and it's bigger than first year writing. Our field is enriched by its ever-expanding knowledge base. At the same time, 
As an organization, our identity, centered on college composition and communication, and our mission are what distinguishes us from other related professional groups. I'd like to argue that we embrace first year writing as the particular site where SEAS as a professional organization and its members have the greatest ability to influence policy, pedagogy, professionalization, students through our teaching and scholarship and where there is the greatest exigence for our work. When I refer to first year writing in this talk, I am not talking about a particular content, but rather a space in academia. I am also talking about more than the course or the course sequence, which itself may be offered in various forms and various modes. I'm referring to the whole network around first year writing, which may include developmental coursework, ESL classes, writing centers and writing programs. I'm referring to the writing assessment processes linked to first year writing, such as placement and programmatic or institutional assessment. I'm talking about the various programs that first year writing enables, including WAC and WID programs, advanced composition courses, writing majors, and graduate programs. Additionally, first year writing serves as a benchmark for determining college readiness for secondary teachers, policymakers, and testing agencies alike. And it has spawned an entire industry of first year writing substitutes or alternatives, including dual enrollment and early college programs, AP and IB programs, prior learning and competency-based uh, assessments. From its founding, C centered on freshman English as a problem. As the early journals illustrate, and I don't think we're there yet, but I'll, so I'll read some of the titles. Uh, One-legged wingless bird, freshman English. So this is from uh, C's in 1950. The problem of freshman English in professional school, in liberal arts college, in university, in the 1951, 1952 issues. The professional status of composition teacher in 1952. According to John Gerber, the first C's chair, many of the problems that dominated early C's programs and C's journals centered on teaching-related issues, such as dealing with the struggling writers or international students, improving student reading, writing, grading, improving high school and college articulation, addressing grammar and linguistics, and preparing students for careers. Professional issues, such as the status of freshman English instructors and teacher preparation were also important early concerns. But the more things change, the more they stay the same. While the practical problems of teaching persist, as the discipline matured and professionalized, the members of, of excuse me, the numbers of students taking first year writing increased and diversified. The problems have become more complex. About this time last year, I had the opportunity to contribute to a studies in writing and rhetoric blog series, revisiting Berlin's rhetoric and writing on the 30th anniversary of its publication. As I reread Rhetoric and Reality for the first time since graduate school, I was particularly struck by the repeated rise and fall in prominence of particular beliefs about first year writing over time, the consequences of such beliefs, and the conditions that create and recreate them. I noticed several familiar uh, issues. The denigration of students and student writing, the vilification of high school English teachers, the marginalized place of writing instruction and instructors in the academy, and the shifting purposes of first year writing, a vocational school, a means of assimilation, a gatekeeping device, a service to other disciplines, an introduction to academic writing and to writing in the discipline, a foundation to democracy. One particular problem, the disappearance of first year composition and basic writing from the general education curriculum caught my attention. At one point, Berlin addresses a 1973 report by Ron Smith, which observed the reduction of and exemption from first-year writing offerings at colleges and universities and predicted the eventual erasure of freshman composition. Smith noted a set of symptoms, including alternative means for granting credits, and a series of causes, such as tighter budgets, difficulty demonstrating courses value added, external and internal pressures to reduce gen ed requirements that are eerily reminiscent of today's higher education landscape. Berlin responds, quote, Smith's prognosis, like all other predictions of the demise of freshman writing course, provided or proved to be inaccurate. Today, the freshman writing course remains an essential element 
of the education of the majority of college students and the graduate training and research effort given to re rhetoric, history, theory, and practice is greater than ever before. Berlin's final assertion still holds true, but I can't help but wonder in the current political and economic climate if Smith's warnings were not erroneous, but premature. Around the same time Smith was prognosticating about the fall of first year writing, Newsweek announced that Johnny can't write, and the 1977 C's chair Richard Lloyd Jones observed how writing was suddenly on the center of the public stage, the crisis of writing skills. As Lloyd Jones described, there is a crisis and it is us. And that alarm grew in intensity as we neared the 21st century when the demand for higher education and the need for college-educated citizenry increased at the same time higher education as being, as Prince Anson described in his 2013 chair's address, fragmented and deinstitutionalized. And at the same time as outcomes-driven accountability measures accompany a public divestment in public education and in higher education. So the state of first-year writing, it's complicated. Let's start with the state of higher education. In 2016, the on-time high school graduation rate, uh, rate rose to a record high of 84%. And nearly 70% of high school graduates were enrolled in colleges and universities. That is a far cry from the levels of a, the decade in which CS was founded. In 1940, only 30% of high school students graduated. 20% of those attended college and 6% graduated. As of the fall of 2017, over 20 million students attend U.S. colleges and universities, over 17 million of whom are undergraduates. Of those 17 million, 7 million begin their college careers at the two-year college, which welcomes the largest proportion of students of color, first-generation college students, returning students, and students from low-income families to higher education. Most of these 17 million undergraduate students will be required to complete first-year writing, a uh, first-year writing course of some type, with about half of the first-year writing courses and the vast majority of developmental writing being taken by students at the two-year college. Most incoming undergraduate students, that is, excluding those who earn college credit through other means or prior to entering college. For instance, nearly one million students took AP English language or English literature exams this year. Of that nearly one million, about half earned scores of three or higher, potentially earning them college credit for first year writing. Additionally, according to NASEP, uh, the National Alliance for Concurrent Enrollment Programs, by the 2010-2011 school year, over 80% of public high schools enrolled students in college courses. The Education Commission of the State's state profiles, last updated in 2015, reveal that nearly all of the 50 states offer some sort of program for earning college credit in high school. The 2015 ACT report discusses the significant increases in enrollment since the early 2000s. In the 2002-2003 academic year, approximately 1.2 students took one or more dual enrollment courses. By the 2010 academic year, that number jumped to 2 million, a 75% increase in less than a decade. Eva Payne's NTT blog, The Good, The Bad, and The Pot uh, Potentially Ugly, notes, as the number of participants in dual enrollment programs continue to rise, so has the popularity of these programs among po uh, policymakers and educational leaders. Between 2013 and 2015, 20 governors mentioned dual enrollment proposals or existing dual program, uh, program successes in their state of the state addresses. The current House GOP version of the Higher Education Act reauthorization, the PROSPER Act, and its Democratic counterpart, the AIM Higher Initiative, both promote concurrent enrollment or early college programs. While I haven't been able to find credits granted by course designation, it's not hard to extrapolate that the most common dual and credit courses offered in high school are likely the most common general education requirement in college, first year writing. At the same time as competency-based education and prior learning assessments, dual credit and credit by testing are proliferating and eroding the traditional notion of first year writing courses, college and universities increasingly rely on adjunct and contingent labor to teach developmental and first-year writing courses. 
2012 Coalition of the Academic Workforce Report found that approximately 75% of post-secondary workforce were employed in positions off tenure track. Numbers which include part-time faculty, full-time non-tenure track faculty, and graduate student teaching assistants. A 2014 report from the Center for Community College Student Engagement found that 58% of two-year college faculty taught part-time. While neither report breaks out numbers by discipline, given the small class sizes and universality of first-year writing requirements, issues of labor tend to disproportionately impact our discipline. Last year, Linda Adler-Kasner traced the narrative of higher education's failure professed by the network of NGOs, granting agencies, businesses, consulting firms, and policy institutes she termed the education intelligence complex. The EIC solutions to this problem privilege proficiency and efficiency, aka success and completion, over learning and becoming educated. The EIC's view of accountability is market-oriented, with value measured almost exclusively in economic terms. Because as Linda asserts, writing doesn't belong to us, it's truly everybody's business, first-year writing and developmental writing are primary targets for the EIC's quest to streamline and economize higher education. All of these trends put first-year writing and the students in programs, including graduate programs, that such courses support at risk. As a discipline, we bear some responsibility for its endangerment. Despite the significant space that first-year writing occupies in our discipline, our scholarship fails to account for the teaching majority or the spaces in which they work. In Occupy Writing Studies, Hassel and Giordano observe, a majority of post-secondary writing instructors will not spend their careers teaching upper division courses, training graduate students, or researching narrowly focused issues in rhetoric and composition. Yet, as John Lovis asserted in his 2002 chair's address, much of the theorizing in our profession about basic writing, assessment, grading practices, teaching methods, and test production by students has a thin empirical base because it does not account for the work being done to your colleges and other open admissions universities, or open admissions institutions. Lovis continued his argument, you cannot represent a field if you ignore half of it. You cannot generalize about com excuse me. You cannot generalize about composition if you do not know half the work being done. Hassel and Giordano attribute this inequity to the hierarchical structure of the academy, which assigns relative value to work based on the status of the institution. Jensen and Toth take these critiques a step further, asserting that the structural ignorance is also a moral failing one fueled by academic tradition of elitism that maps in shameful ways on the relative class, race, and ethnic makeup of our institutions. Additionally, despite arguments for the value of first-year writing composition in the undergraduate curriculum, we often assign responsibility for teaching these courses to the least prepared, least experienced, and least supported instructors. Doing so feeds into another troublesome narrative that anyone can teach writing. Reducing first-year writing to proficiency development and perpetuating ne negative stereotypes about those who teach it, such as mischaracterization, such mischaracterizations make it easy then to farm out the task to overworked high school English teachers or literature graduate students and enable competency exams to substitute for teaching and learning. This mythology also endangers our ability to argue for working conditions and the necessity of a professionalized teaching faculty. With all the problems we face, it may leave some longing for the good old days of the profession, but I don't. Most often, more often than not, I find the good old days are a tale of exclusion. Rather, our problems are a gift because they inspire and even incite change. Although the ubiquitous of freshman composition has eroded, some scholars in our discipline would argue against a universal first-year writing requirement, and, the, sorry, and that some scholars in our discipline would argue against a universal first-year writing requirement. First-year writing remains the most universal general education requirement, and as such, it is our space of power. For various reasons and for many stakeholders, first-year writing continues to be viewed as an essential part of a college education. While policymakers and education reformers may seek to economize its instruction, no one seems to deny the necessity of communication and critical thinking skills in today's economy. First year writing is the space where we can best exercise our power through disciplinarity. 
for good and bad, writing is one of the academic disciplines which is directly touched by policy, local, state, and federal. But it also means we have the power to affect change through our scholarship. We know writing, we know effective writing instruction, and we have a full and rich research base on which to make these claims. More importantly, first year writing reaches more students than any other post-secondary course. Virtually all college students, regardless of institution type or certificate or degree program goals, and regardless of whether or not they complete their college education, will take first year writing. That is power. So how do we solve a problem like first year writing? To paraphrase Cheryl Glenn's conclusion to her 2008 chair's address, we do the work. And I'd like to add that we do the work strategically. We act where we have capacity, and we conscientiously create the conditions for change. First, changing the public narrative through strategic advocacy. There is a push for C's to speak out on a whole range of issues, whether they relate directly to our mission or not. This is unsurprising, I suppose, given how broadly all public issues can be connected in some way to communication and rhetoric, and given the politically engaged stance of many, perhaps most, in our member organization. This speaking out occurs largely through internal channels, statements broadcast to our members through social media, resolutions articulated in an early morning convention meeting, position statements warehoused on a website, and it is often directed towards member audiences not the most effective way to become, in the words of our 2020 vision statement, the leading voice in public discussions about what it means to be an effective writer and to deliver quality writing instruction. While it is important to identify and express our collective values, our power in the public sphere is rooted in our expertise and our ability to leverage our expertise to create change. As these members, first year writing, the whole of it that I described earlier, is the primary space where we have the expertise of value to policymakers and other public audiences. And it is incumbent upon us to make the case repeatedly and publicly for what writing is, how it develops, and why it matters. While federal policies are often the most publicly prominent and attract the most attention and passion from our members, as a nonprofit disciplinary organization, NCTEs and C's influence is limited in this sphere. Additionally, as Joyce Lott Carter noted in her 2016 chair's address, on policy matters, when you're doing the asking, the power rests in the ASCII's hands, not the askers. And that is why an important strategy shift for NCTE's policy advocacy in recent years has been to position ourselves as a resource to federal policymakers, to position ourselves as the trusted public voice on matters related to literacy and writing in education. This is a position that is paying off as increasingly lawmakers are turning to NCT and its constituencies for information and feedback. Positioning ourselves as the trusted public voice requires building relationships among legislatures from both sides of the aisle. It requires attention to exigence, what policies are currently being considered. This spring is the reauthorization of the Higher Education Act, and it also requires approaching issues pragmatically rather than philosophically shaping our asks around the policymakers' needs. Another consideration of policy advocacy on the federal level is capacity. How can the organization have a greater effect on issues at hand? Though the organization is large and though its members, or through the organization at large, or through its members influencing their legislature, legislators. Where is there a space for our distinct professional voice and where are we better served by joining the chorus? Generally, federal laws and allocations do not directly affect our discipline. They do, however, often impact our students, and for C's, this impact is most evident in first-year writing. The reality is that most national policies are actually enacted by state legislatures and to continue to borrow Linda's term, the EIC, through grants. In this space, CS as an organization is not nimble enough or in a position to take action, though it can help members keep abreast of policy trends through NCT Policy Analyst Initiative and its conventions and publications. 
CSE's members, however, can make a difference. Higher education reforms imposed by state legislatures and promulgated by the EIC often do connect directly to first year writing through developmental education reforms, placement reforms, writing assessments, and dual credit programs. And CSE's members have already had some success influencing policies in these spaces. For example, former C's EC member Les Perlman is credited with bringing down the robo-scored SAT essay exam. Peter Adams <laughs> and his County of, uh, County of Baltimore Community College colleagues developed a new approach to developmental writing, ALP, a grassroots effort grounded in disciplinary and interdisciplinary scholarship that has since been adopted as a best practice by reform-minded NGOs like Achieving the Dream. Most importantly, we can act locally. We are smart people, skilled communicators, effective rhetoricians, and there are a lot of us, nationally and internationally, and we occupy spaces in which we have influence. In fact, we have the most power in our local context to shape local policies and practices and to shape the local narrative about writing. And that is where our work will have the most impact for ourselves, our students, our institutions, and our communities. In this space, SEAS, the organization, plays a supporting role, connecting members to our collective expertise and experience, including our position statements, and coming soon, a strategic action toolkit. Disciplinary inclusion and equity. I recently received reviewer feedback on an article I co-wrote with a couple of Tyka colleagues related to, to your colleges. The reviews were positive, offered constructive uh, revision suggestions, but one particular comment struck a nerve. It essentially asked us to justify why this work, our work, matters for four-year college faculty. My collaborators and I wondered aloud if university colleagues ever felt compelled to explain why their work mattered to the other members of the same discipline. As one who often reviews the work of two-year college scholars, I can say that this comment has been internalized by many of my two-year college colleagues. I read many manuscripts that beg to be taken seriously. This scholarly exclusion Note that I do not call this exclusiveness is not limited to institution type. We also tend to do a poor job of reading, citing, and representative scholar, representing scholars of color and other marginalized groups in our CS publications. <laughs> and when we do, including them as add-ons and special issues. But my focus is on institution type because that is where the realities of who does the majority of the work of the profession and the scholarship of the profession are most out of sync. According to Hassel and Giordano, the most common faculty experience in teaching English is in the two-year college. Thus, if two-year college teacher scholars are not adequately represented among the core of those who both produce and review, what becomes the baseline knowledge for the members of our profession, then we are not benefiting from the experiences of two-year college faculty. <laughs> the scholarship of first year in basic writing provides a space in which we can create a complete and representative knowledge base. Within the organization, we can do this and are trying to do this through our publications, conventions, programs, research grants, and awards. We do this when we expand and diversify reviewer pools, awards committees, and task forces. We do this when we invite and mentor new and representative voices. Within the larger discipline, we have even more possibilities. We can develop graduate curriculum that reflects and values the entirety of the field, particularly as it relates to first-year writing programs. The recommendations of the 2016 Taika guidelines for preparing teachers of English in the two-year college offer a good starting point for developing a relevant and responsible curriculum, including, but not limited to, integrating readings from TETYC and two-year college scholars into any graduate course relating to pedagogy, basic writing, or first-year writing. We can collaborate with two-year college faculty conducting research on two-year college campuses with two-year college scholars. Given that two-year colleges are particular targets for the higher education reformers who demand large amounts of data collection in exchange for their grant funding, 
there's a vast and fairly untapped resource of local research that two-year colleges can contribute. In Hassel and Giordano's disciplinary re-envisioning, a more inclusive writing studies profession should account for the complex and diverse needs of students who enroll at institutions of access and should better meet the professional needs of the instructors who teach those students. Without such a research base, most instructors cannot find their ways into the teaching realities reflected in the published literature. And I'd add that without such a research base, we cannot effectively advocate for faculty and students. Our policy agenda requires a complete and representative knowledge base. SEAS and its members need evidence in order to enact our mission. Even more, we need to fill in research gaps strategically. For instance, our members are deeply concerned, and rightly so, about deteriorating working conditions of writing faculty. Yet we lack evidence to connect faculty working conditions, including teaching loads, class size, and professional development and support to student learning. Many members are concerned about the proliferation of and efficacy of dual enrollment writing classes, yet discipline-specific research on dual enrollment is very limited. And there is very little motivation among its sponsors and proponents to investigate possible deficits or long-term consequences for these programs. Our professional ethics and values demand it. We cannot work together. We cannot fulfill our mission if we willfully ignore and exclude our members. Professionalizing. Several years ago, I was sent by my college to a workshop on competency-based education, ba uh, hosted by Western Governors University. The goal was simply for me to learn more about how it worked. So I did my best to check my preconceived notions and to rein in the hostilities that I may feel about such an education model. But I still went in with a strong dose of skepticism. I had a lot of questions about how writing was taught. On the first day of the workshop, I asked how WGU handled developmental writing. The response was that they preferred students come in at the college level. Okay? <laughs> but that makes sense in a competency-based program. It's designed to measure proficiency, not develop it. On day two, one workshop facilitator shared the program's freshman writing syllabus with me. On paper, the course appeared in line with other English 101 course syllabi I have seen. It was sufficiently rigorous and required a similar number and complexity of writing projects as compared to my own courses. But I had to ask, how do students engage with feedback and revision in a self-paced program? Do they interact with other students at any point along the way? The answer, there are mentors who can help students with their work. Clearly, my question was not understood. As a discipline, we know that effective communication is more than correctness. It's rhetorical, it's situated, it's developed in and through response. As a discipline, most of us agree that meaning is socially constructed. Before I could ask another question, the workshop facilitator gave me his spiel. As teachers, you have so many jobs. It's like you're riding five horses at once, which I like horses, so I liked the metaphor. Uh, but here, we have disaggregated the teacher's role so that you can focus on one thing. And then he began outlining the different jobs. One person's responsible for course curriculum development, which is standardized. Another person is responsible for assessment, also standardized. Another, the student mentor, essentially is an online tutor, responds to students' questions, and provides individual help. But I want to do all those things, I responded. I've been trained to do all of those things. And suddenly I realized that disaggregate was code for deprofessionalize. Only one job on his list required a specialist with an advanced degree, and that was the curriculum developer, and that was something that could be managed one time on a contractual basis. To work against forces attempting to disaggregate teaching and learning into measurable outcomes and to deprofessionalize teachers, we must take responsibility for professionally, professionalizing all who teach our courses. Doing so is within our capacity. In his 2005 chair's address, Doug Hesse asked who owns writing. And while many may be able to lay claim to it, most certainly we own writing scholarship and we own post-secondary writing instruction, and most particularly, we own first-year writing. We are the ones who teach, who research, who administer writing programs, who develop graduate programs, who mentor writing faculty. 
If we are not serious about change, or if we are serious about changing faculty working conditions, about approving student learning, about maintaining control over writing programs, and about preserving the integrity of our work, we can start by doing our part to make sure all who teach our courses are professionalized. In his 2014 chair's address, Howard Tinberg argued, any attempts by this organization to make a case for public re-engagement with higher education must begin with our own pledge to recommit ourselves to the importance of literacy instruction at all levels, from the novice writer to graduate student to adult learner. This means investing our own time, our own energy, and our own expertise not only into preparing graduate students to teach composition and rhetoric in a variety of settings, but also to reinvest in first-year composition and basic writing courses ourselves, and to assist through meaningful mentoring and uh, the contingent faculty who teach the bulk of those courses. That means, within our home institutions, working to ensure that first-year writing and basic writing courses are taught by teachers who have adequate support and appropriate preparation. C's can help. While the organization does not have the capacity or the mission to bargain and sanction, CS can support members to advocate in their own context with its, or through its position statements. We have one on non-tenure track faculty working conditions and best hiring practices. Uh, through resources developed by its labor liaison and through its collaborative spaces where CS members can network with those who do research and advocacy related to issues of labor. That means directing those directing graduate programs in composition rhetoric prepare future faculty for the full range of writing instruction and research opportunities in the profession. The TICA guidelines for preparing teacher, few, <laughs> teachers of English in the two-year college asserts graduate programs have an ethical and professional obligation to prepare all students, even those who will go on to careers in the four-year institutions, to be knowledgeable about two-year colleges, their students, and their faculty. Such knowledge is essential for understanding the landscape of post-secondary education in the United States. That means those supervising first-year writing programs that employ teaching assistants or teaching faculty who are not writing specialists provide a strong foundation in composition theory and pedagogy, as well as mentoring support, so that the instructors are prepared to teach effectively at a range of institution types. A 2015 survey conducted by the CS Task Force on Teacher Preparation found that over half of the respondents, all CS and TICA members, and all writing professionals, had not completed graduate work in writing studies related field. The CS statement on preparing teachers of college writing reminds us that an investment in training and professional development of writing instructors is an investment in student learning and success and provides concrete strategies for how to cultivate and apply a theoretically informed writing pedagogy. That means engaging with high school English teachers teaching dual enrollment courses through our colleges. We cannot control all spaces where first year writing is taught, but we can shape the programs and practices and develop relationships with high school faculty that will improve writing education at the secondary and post-secondary level. That means resisting the use of standardized curriculum in first-year writing courses, which reinforces a false notion that anyone can teach writing as long as they have a book and a syllabus. And it undercuts instructor autonomy and perpetuates reductionist ideas about writing and learning. Save first-year composition, save the discipline. I didn't watch the series Hero <laughs> that made famous the tagline, save the cheerleader, save the world. But I understand the basic message that saving a part, especially if it's a magical part, and maybe we're magical, uh, saving a part can save the whole. For post-secondary writing, defense of first-year writing, the entire enterprise of first-year writing, is defense of the entire discipline. This may sound dramatic, but I'm not sure if writing studies or C's can survive without it. We certainly will have a much diminished, we certainly will be much dis diminished without this common space, a space that cross, crosses institution types to theorize and practice together, and our ability to influence policy will be much eroded if we cede authority over first year writing to testing companies. But ultimately, it comes back to students. First year writing matters because it touches more students than any college level course. Any, no other discipline has the privilege that we have. Whether these students complete college or not, we can never underestimate the power of the classroom to create changes for students, their communities, and our world. 
First year writing is the access point to higher education and as such is often a transformative and even liberatory space for students. And we owe it to students and to our ideals of democracy and justice to protect that space. Thank you.